Hey, the internet, I'm Skylar. You're watching another episode of Suncrest On Demand. Before we go any further, I'm sure someone is watching for the first time, and we're so glad that you're here. Help me help you help you help me help everybody and text the word Suncrest to 94000. When you do that, we'll send you a digital gift card directly to your phone for some coffee simply for getting this far in the video. Now here's a tip for everyone who's watching. Make sure you have the Suncrest app. When you use our app, you get insider access, things like past content, upcoming events, stuff to help you, your kids, and your students engage with their faith journey, and so much more. You need it, gotta get it. And actually, if you are looking to take a next step right now in your own faith journey, our app is the best tool to use. You can find the next steps button right on the homepage. Take a look right now, sign up for baptism, to join a group to find your people here at Suncrest, or to join a serving team to make a difference. In our app and on our website, you can also partner with us financially. Your generosity makes a huge difference in Northwest Indiana and beyond through starting new churches. So on behalf of all of us, thank you for using your finances to change lives. Here's how the rest of this video is going to go. We're going to listen to music. In fact, let us know a lyric that was meaningful, that was encouraging, that you found beneficial. After that, we're going to take communion together. Each week we focus on the sacrificial love of Jesus through a simple meal. So now is the time right now to go gather some food, grab a drink to represent Jesus' body and his blood. And after the song is done, I'm gonna put a timer on the screen. Feel free during that time to eat or drink when you are ready. After communion is done, we're gonna to listen to this week's message. Once that is done, let us know something you heard that was meaningful in the live chat. Here we go.
So uh, we are in the last episode of How to Decide, and it's been a good journey, hasn't it? We've been having a good time together. I do want to give credit. I was inspired to do this series by a book called Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets that shaped me in some significant ways, and I've seen how it's brought a message from God to us over the last month. So it's been awesome to see how all of you engage it. Uh, one last time here, let's just go where we've been going before. Good questions, of course, lead to good decisions, and good decisions lead to a good life. Um, maybe, maybe the best definition of a good life is a life that has great relationships. Because listen, I don't think there's anything wrong with making a lot of money or gaining some status or moving up in the world, all those sorts of things. Nothing wrong with those at all. However, everybody who's lived life for a little while knows this. When your relationships are good, life is good. And where your relationships aren't good, it actually doesn't matter how much money you have or how highly you climbed the corporate ladder. Relationships are everything. And nobody, nobody pictures their preferred, preferred future as, I hope I'm alone. Nobody does that. It's always about having somebody at your side and having a healthy relationship. That is the good life. And you have the steering wheel. That's the good decision that we're gonna look at today to say, hey, what decisions can I make so that I have the best chance to have rich relationships in my life. We've been looking at this proverb, last time for this, the prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and they just pay the penalty. It's almost like they don't even stop to ask the right questions in life so that they can shift the wheel, turn the right direction and set life on its course. So I want you to hear this. We've been through four questions. We did the integrity question. Am I being honest with myself really? We did the legacy question because your life is telling a story and people will tell stories about you after you're gone. And the question is, what story is your life telling? We had the conscience question. This is when something kind of dings your conscience or if you're a follower of Jesus, the spirit prompts you and just saying, when you feel that tension, just pause and pay attention to the tension. And last week we talked about the maturity question, which is not what is the right thing to do or what do I have the right to do or anything like that. It's just What is the wise thing to do? Now, these four questions that we've explored so far are a little different than the fifth question we're going to explore. First of all, on the first four questions, I can essentially guarantee you that there is an ROI, a return on investment. If you answer those questions well, it will be better for your life. Um, I just want you to know that while the question you're going to ask today has the potential for ROI, there is no guarantee for that. The first four questions are really questions that are rooted in our humanity. It's, it's just the way God relates to the whole world, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not. These questions are good tools for you. But the fifth question tonight is actually particularly a question for those who are followers of Jesus. And I, before I show you what the question is, I, I want you to live with this for a moment. Because when you see this question and and you respond to it, I think it says something about you. If you think of yourself as a follower of Jesus, but when you see this question, you think, eh, not really interested. I rarely say this, but I gotta say it. You should question whether you're a follower of Jesus or not. This question is so closely tied to being a follower of Jesus that if you reject this question, I think you're rejecting being a follower of Jesus. And this is important. If you don't think of yourself as a follower of Jesus, when you see this question, if you feel like that's a great question, I'm not a follower of Jesus, but I would like to orient my life around that question. I can see how living that question out could change the world for the better. If you embrace this question, but you're not a follower of Jesus, I think what Jesus would say to you is, hey, you are not far from the kingdom. Maybe you have trouble with the idea that Jesus was the son of God, maybe that you can't get your head around that. Maybe you can't can't quite embrace that Jesus literally rose from the dead. These things are, of course, central to Christianity, but I'm just telling you, if you embrace this teaching of Jesus, you could follow Jesus and and you are not far from the kingdom. So don't, don't let me wait any longer. The fifth and final question is the relationship question. And the relationship question asks, what does love require of me. I want all of us, of course, for the the next 25 minutes or so to think about this reflectively in all the situations of my life. Could I live with the posture and say, what does love require of me? And then just do whatever love requires of you. 
There's a very high standard for this. It's designed to be that way. There's the potential to change the world with this. It's designed to be that way. This question in your life, I'm wondering if you can imagine living your whole life this way. Well, what does love require of me? And then whatever love requires of you, just do that. And this scales, right? This means that when you're on the Borman Expressway and someone cuts you off, you just say, so what does love require of me? When you're in the checkout aisle and you sense a prompting from God to to talk to the person behind you or help the person in front of you or pay for somebody's group, you can just ask the question, but what does love require of me? When you're eating at a restaurant and you have a server, whether the server is a great server or a horrible server, you just kind of ask the question, what does love require of me? Just as you go through life. You can do this in your your one-off relationships. You know, you might have coworkers or classmates. You don't know them well. They're not your best friends, but as you relate to one another and you go through life together, you have to ask yourself, so as I relate to them, what, what does love require of me? When you post on social media, you just have to stop and think, but what does love require of me? When you're sitting at your kid's baseball game, you just think, but what does love require of me? There's that outer circle of relationships, but maybe most important is your inner circle of relationships. So that when you think about the relationship you have with your spouse, with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, with your son or your daughter, your mom or your dad or best friend, you think, so what does love require of me? If in that inner circle of relationships, there are relationships with tension or frustration or difficulty right now, this is a very important question. What does love require of me? And actually, just to to finish out the whole circle, it was Jesus who said, love your enemies. So even for those who have done you wrong, you take a posture and says, but what what does love require of me. Now, I want us to think about ourselves and what love requires of us. But before we get into that, I've been asking you to stand in front of the mirror. And I have a few questions I want you to ask while you're standing in front of the mirror. I'm going to help you ask them while we're together. And, And I actually want to flip the question a little bit first. So when you're in the mirror, we should ask this question. Have I received a transforming love? Not even yet, am I giving a transforming love? Am I, am I acting on love? But have I been on the receiving end of someone who themselves was asking, what does love require of me? And I don't think I'm overstating this. There may be nothing more significant about, significant about your life and who you are than whether you have been on the receiving end of love that transforms from someone else. You see, some people, maybe you, have never been on the receiving end of that kind of love. You had a mom who was bitter. You had a dad who was absent. You had grandparents who were disengaged. You had friends, but they never put you in front of them. And you've never actually had a personal encounter understanding who Christ is and all that he has done for each of us. And if you've never sensed that you're on the receiving end of someone else's sacrificial love in a way that transformed you, then then I want you to encounter it today. Because I actually think it's the only path that changes us. But some of us, have been on the receiving end of that love. We have parents who gave and gave and gave. And maybe we have a spouse who forgave and forgave and forgave. And we have a friend who when we needed it most, they laid down their own thing and they picked up our thing and they walked with us. And some of us have encountered the love of God through Christ himself that understands no matter what we have done, Christ went to the cross for us and he gave everything he had. 
out of his love for us. And if you have been on the receiving end of that kind of love, you know it transforms. And I'm asking you to now let the posture of your life be one that looks across the table, looks across the street, and says, I will be that person. Where does this question come from? Well, of course, it comes from the life of Jesus. But I want you to see that this question actually was formed in the pinnacle moments of the life of Jesus. John was one of Jesus' followers. Actually, John refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. He just, he just wanted to make sure that was the defining aspect of how he was known, that, that he knew of God's love for him through Christ. When John wrote his biography of Jesus, it's 21 chapters long, but get this, chapters 13 through 19, so a full third of it, cover only a 24-hour period at the pinnacle of Jesus' life. It captures him on the night before he went to the cross when he's in the upper room with his disciples, all the way up to giving his life on the cross. And so we pick up this story in the upper room after Jesus has lived for 30 years, and had his followers following him for three. In the upper room, he starts to crystallize something he's been hinting at. Jesus, people were starting to understand, isn't your normal rabbi. He seems to have miraculous powers. His teachings seem to have a, a certain insight. He, he had already been kind of dropping hints that something new was coming, something different, something more inclusive, something that wasn't just what had been in their Jewish religion. And in this moment with his closest followers, the men who he loved, he reveals, here's what he says. I will only be with you a little longer. This made no sense to them. Jesus' popularity was increasing and now he's saying he's going to leave them. He starts to clarify. He doesn't mean that he's going to walk away and get a new group of followers. He's actually going to leave this earth. And they're a little unsettled by that. He says, a new command I give you. Now, in some ways, the last thing that all these Jewish men needed was a new command. They definitely didn't need another command. There were 10 commandments. Those were hard enough to follow. Those 10 had already been expanded to about 600 commandments. If you've ever read the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, then you know there's lots of rules in there. Jesus had already grouped all of those rules to help people understand them. He, he's the one who, who said the golden rule. Do to others as you would have them do unto you. And then he said, all the law and the prophets, they all hang on that single idea. But when Jesus here says he's going to give a new command, he isn't adding a command. He's actually doing something that if he is not the son of God is blasphemous. But Jesus has already performed miracles and he has already claimed that he can forgive sin, something only God can do. And he is about to go to the cross and then rise from the dead to demonstrate that he is God himself. And he's marking a transition, whatever would be central from this day forward for anyone who's a follower of Jesus. He says, a new command to replace the old commands I give to you. And he says, love one another. Now, maybe you've read this before. If you'd open up the scriptures, reading the story of Jesus, and you're all, aren't you always like this? How I am like, that's not new, Jesus. <laughs> you made a big deal about this, this new command, but love one another, that's, that's kind of been going on for a while. You've been doing it for, that's nothing new about that. But it's actually the next sentence he speaks that makes it a new command. He says, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now, we have a little benefit the disciples didn't have. We saw what Jesus did right after he said this. For just a moment, would you put yourself in that room with the disciples? He's got Matthew there. He's got Peter there. He's got John there. He's got, he's got his disciples. And he's actually looking them in the eye and he says, guys, this is what I'm talking about. As I've loved you, so you love one another. I, I'm not 
leveraging my authority. I'm not playing the God card here. I'm leveraging the example of my life. And for the rest of time, people who call themselves followers of Jesus, this will be the defining characteristic. They will do whatever love requires them to do. Matthew, you remember that? Matthew, you remember where you were when I met you? Matthew, you remember you were a tax collector. Everybody hated you. You were the one that everyone had given up on. You'd even kind of given up on yourself. But I went to you and I said, life doesn't have to end there. And I loved you even though you were despised and I forgave you and I welcomed you and then I walked with you the way I loved you, Matthew. The way I loved you, that's how I want you all to love one another. Peter, Peter, you remember some of our moments, Peter? You remember that time I, had actually, I actually had to call you Satan? I had to call you Satan because you were way off track, but, but just because you were way off track didn't mean you were done. I'm the one who restores you. And by the way, Peter, I'm about to restore you again in just a couple of days here. The way I loved you, the way I didn't give up on you, the way I gave myself, the way I, the way I absorbed things for you, that's how you would love one another. And then Jesus said, by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Now, this is, this is why I need to say to you, if you're a follower of Jesus, but you don't embrace the question, what does love require of you? I'm not sure you can call yourself a follower of Jesus. If you think of yourself as a follower of Jesus, but you just do what you want when you want, you give people what they deserve, you don't give them love. I'm not sure you can call yourself a follower of Jesus. Jesus is the one who said, the way the world will know who are my disciples and who aren't my disciples is if they love one another. And Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? He said, you were leaving us. And Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. And just so you know, there were 12 people in that room. One of them was Judas, who betrayed Jesus and then sadly took his own life. One of them was John, who's writing this story. And John lived out all of his days on the island of Patmos in exile. He was essentially arrested and then sent to not bother anybody. The other 10 disciples would eventually give their life for the message of Jesus they would do what love required them to do. And so when Jesus says, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later, it means that though it might cost you your whole life, I'm gonna ask you to love, and then you'll follow me into death, and you will follow me into new life. So, I just wanna ask you this question. You and I look in the mirror ourselves, do those around me receive transforming love from me? It's worth looking in the mirror at first to say, have I received that? But I want to ask all of you, okay, when I'm going through life, when I'm driving down the road or at the restaurant or at work or with my classmates, with my son, with my spouse? Do the people around me experience this transforming love? And I want to ask you to set the course of your life on being able in everything that you do, say, I'm answering the question, what does love require of me? Now, I've had this conversation. I have, it, I have it with people in the commons area all the time. I have it with people in my office. I have it with people over coffee. I have it with people. And, and essentially, anytime I'm talking to someone, we get to some form of this question. Are you doing what love requires of you? And then I get the pushback, and I understand the pushback. They say something like, well, she doesn't deserve it. He doesn't deserve it. 
He didn't do what he was supposed to do. She didn't do what she was. I get it, but that's not the threshold. That wasn't Jesus' threshold toward us. When Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you, he then went out and was betrayed. He was judged unjustly. He was beaten and he was mocked and he was nailed to a cross and he died for you, and for me. Not because we deserved it. Actually, we didn't deserve it. That's kind of the whole point of love. The Apostle Paul would come along later. The Apostle Paul, the one who was out killing Christians and persecuting the church and, and, and leading the charge against the things of Jesus, then he himself had an encounter with Jesus. It was an encounter where he was forgiven, where he experienced grace, where he understood who Jesus was. And his whole life was transformed. And he started to write in these ways to say, man, this is what love requires. When the Apostle Paul, who had had that same thing ex experience in his life, started to write in the book of Philippians, this is what he said to, to people who are followers of Jesus. He said, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. I don't want it to be just an empty mantra, but I want us all to keep embracing this, that those of us who are followers of Jesus, the point is we follow what Jesus did. We live the life Jesus lived. And that's what Paul's saying. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. And I know I'm making a very significant request of you and your life that you would give your life for the people who are around you. It might come in one massive event. I mean, it's possible that someone you love will have a bullet coming at them and you'll have to jump in front of the bullet. Not likely, possible. More likely, the way you give your life are the decisions you make every day to be a servant to humble yourself toward those who are around you. And I don't know how that feels to you right now. I don't know if that feels like a burden, something you could hardly carry, or if it feels inspirational to think, oh yeah, this is how we change the world. But it, but it does get us to the place to say, what does love require of me? Now, if you could live by this mantra, what does love require of me? My guess is that in 90% of the situations that you're in, you would almost instinctively know what to do. You would know what not to do and you would know what to do. And maybe in 10% of the situations, it's a little more complicated where you're trying to figure out, okay, what, what exactly, Greg, do you mean that love is required of us? Now, my guess is in those 10% of those situations, you have some people around you who, if you talk to them, they would, try, they would help you understand, yep, that's what love looks like in that situation. But just in case it doesn't seem clear to you, actually the scriptures answer this question for us. So let me be as specific as I can possibly be. What does love require of me? The Apostle Paul wrote a beautiful passage of scripture in 1 Corinthians 13. It was not intended to be read at weddings, although it commonly is, where he describes what love looks like. And maybe you've heard it before. I, you know, some of us know it from memory. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. Love always trusts, always protects, always perseveres. That's what love is. And so to, to push you, and I do want to push you a little bit today, to push you on this, I want you to think for a moment about the person in your life that you're having difficulty loving. And this is what love requires, patience. Love requires 
that you yield to the pace of the person you care about instead of asking them to live life at your pace. That's patience. What does love require of me? It requires kindness. Kindness most commonly comes when we come across a situation where someone else is feeling weak and overwhelmed. And what kindness does is it takes my strength and I lend my strength to you so that you have strength and we then can walk through this together. That's a kind approach to life. What does love require of you? It requires honor. Love never treats someone dishonorably. Love never uses sarcasm. Love never talks behind someone's back instead of talking directly to them. Love honors. I don't know who you're having trouble loving right now, but if it's in your inner circle, this is what I wanna ask you to picture. I want you to, to picture that you are taking them and putting them up on a pedestal because you're gonna honor them. And you would never do anything that dishonors them. What did the passage say? Love is not self-seeking. It's not looking for what I can get out of it. It's looking for what can I give to it. In some sense, somebody needs to hear this. Love absorbs. It absorbs the situations that other people find themselves in. That's how you honor them. You absorb what they deserve. That is what Jesus did for us. And so I'm asking you in your relationships to absorb the shortcomings of others. Love, what does love require? It requires forgiveness. Apostle Paul says it keeps no record of wrongs. There's, there is no way to love and yet keep score of the past. And love, what does love require? Protection. Love always protects. And so that means it protects the person. You become the defender of and the advocate for the person who's standing next to you. And it protects the relationship, which would mean you and I smuggle nothing into a relationship that could harm the relationship. We smuggle nothing into our lives that could harm the relationship that we have. What does love require? Patience, kindness, honor, forgiveness, and protection. And I want to ask you to walk around with that all the time. Actually, I got a little tool for you. How about this? Wouldn't you love to have these qualities as the lock screen on your phone? I know you'd love that. That way, every time you look at your phone, you'll be reminded, this is what love requires of me. And if you want this lock screen, it's provided for you. You can just go to this uh, QR code or it's in the Suncrest app and you can put in front of you every day this question, what does love require of me? So, <clears throat> I want to ask you to follow Jesus. And when he says, love one another as I have loved you, to love like Jesus. And I want to ask you to do it with whoever's coming to your mind as quickly as you possibly can. It's possible that right now in this room, you're sitting right next to someone and you know that's where the gap of love is. And right now it's time to reach over and grab their hand. Say we could do this. 
For some of you, you know the person you haven't loved. And actually, before you go home today, on your way home, you should go out of your way and stop at their home and you should knock on their door. Say, hey, I just have to tell you, I don't think I've been handling our relationship right. For some of you, you need to write the note, make the phone call, set up the coffee to be had. And what's gonna happen when you reach your hand over or knock on the door or write on the note or set up the coffee? Will the person on the other end appreciate that you are doing what love requires them to do? Here's my answer to that. Maybe. Maybe not. Remember, this is the one, I warned you, that doesn't guarantee an ROI. Some people accepted Christ's love and some people rejected Christ's love. Not for a moment did that stop him from doing what is right. And of course, it does cast the vision for us of how the world actually changes. Before you turn off this video, hit the like, subscribe, and share buttons. Hit all the buttons. We'll see you next week, same time, same channel. Until then, go and be the church.